Okay, so I'm going to uh, call the meeting to order of, for the Ad Hoc Transition Planning Committee of the uh, San Diego Commission on Police Practices uh, of March 19th, 2001. Um, for the uh, role, I'll just, oops, hold on a second here. Oops, hold on a second. My, what did I do here? Uh, I'll just read the participants. Um, so I'm Doug Case and I am the chair of the uh, committee. Uh, we have committee members, Diana Dent, uh, Craver, Marty Newman, and Patrick Anderson. And then we have our liaison with uh, San Diegans for Justice, Kate Yavendetti. We have uh, ex-official member and chair of the commission, Brandon Hilpert. And then we have uh, guest, uh, Mason Wechter. And I think I've got everybody. And uh, so I think that the uh, first order of business uh, should be uh, in recognition of the NCAA tournament of having everybody sing the SDSU fight song. Uh, but I can't do it because it's not on the agenda and that would be a Brown Act violation. And I could do it under public comment, but I don't think that's in the jurisdiction of the committee. And uh, so we'll move on to... Uh, updates but i do have on my shirt uh it's not from the tournament but it's from uh, the champions of the uh san diego of the mountain west tournament um anyway uh implementation oh. ordinance uh this is the section not well first of all i guess i should see if there's any other public comment no, other public, no public comment received but let's just note that commissioner vaughn is here and um commissioner harrington is um Okay. And, uh, we need to select somebody to uh, take minutes. Uh, Nancy agreed last time. Um, I haven't received them yet as a reminder to Nancy. Um, so is somebody else willing to take notes this time? Uh, Diana, I, you... I would, but I have a lot of stuff to talk about when it comes to me. So I might not be the best person. Okay. Uh, how about Diana or Joe? It's been a while since you've done it. How about Joe? <laughs> Joe you take notes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> being, being, in a, being, being from the military, you never volunteer for anything. So, anyway, well, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, and Nancy, if you can get me the notes from last time, that would be helpful. Um, in terms of the updates, uh, there's been nothing really new on the implementation ordinance. Uh, I should check in with Joan to see what her timeline is of uh, sending something back to uh, public safety and uh, livable neighborhoods. Um, I think at our last meeting was the same day as we had the meet and confer with the POA and the interim uh, standard operating procedures were approved the PSNL and meeting on March the 10th. Um, there was an addition of a sentence at the very beginning which basically says that the uh, commission will follow the law <laughs> and uh, indicated that we would uh, adhere to um, uh, timelines that are specified in uh, POBAR and case law case law relating to POBAR. And that was the only change that was made as a result of that. Um, but it is the forewarning of how contentious and uh, complicated uh, our future meeting confers may be. Um, uh, also, can, what, I, can I ask yes. a question about that? Uh huh. About the whole timeline issue? Sure. I, I don't know if that's somewhere else on the agenda. Uh, well, it, we, we have implementation ordinance, and so that could be a fall under that. Okay, I'll wait. Well, well we, we already did the ordinance update, and so you can, okay. go, you can go and ask so, your question. So here's my question. It seems to me that that the POBAR timeline has to deal with discipline, the one year for discipline. But I've never quite understood why uh, CLERB, for example, or why the commission of the former CRB could not continue to in conduct an investigation, even if it goes past a year, even with the understanding that there cannot be an imposition of discipline. 
So, so I'm wondering why the commission feels bound by this um, one year statute of limitations on its work um, with the exception of discipline. So I, I, I guess well, I would uh, like uh, either uh, an yeah. answer or a discussion about that. Well, actually a very good question. I'm not sure how much detail I can get into what we discussed and we confer, uh, but uh, that was the position that we took, um, is that uh, the one year uh, uh, deadline refers to the imposition of discipline. Um, their attorneys claim uh, that there is a court case uh, that uh, indicates that uh, a sustained finding is de facto discipline. Um, and uh, we didn't change anything uh, in our document other than to add that sentence that we would com comply with uh, <coughs> with the penal code and uh, associated case law. And so you, you raised a very good question. We agree, and that was the position that we took in the meeting and confer. Did that answer your question? No. Uh, and a very good question. Because very, it's the same point that I raised and question that I raised. And so, yes, uh, it, it may need some further legal analysis if that if that sort of thing comes up, where you're running past past the one year. And right. Doug, I'll just point out that we already do that. I mean, we have cases that go past the one year, and we finish them, even I, though we're not doing it investigations. We're doing reviews, but. I, I agree, um, and uh, and our, our attorneys did send some of the court cases that they make, made reference to and so forth, and so it may arise in the future. I don't know, um, but uh, we've taken um, the position that uh, Kate just advocated for. Um, for for anyone who's curious, it's, they're called the Coloca cases. C a l o c a. And it was actually the unions, um, we, we can forward uh, the summaries that we got as well, because um, it's all public, I think. Um, but uh, I believe at least one of the cases was actually the, the San Diego Police Officer Association's union um, attorneys. I think they actually fought that case, but it was uh, the county. So it's not San Diego City, but still applies. And I think that's why they know it very well, or so they, they, they believe they know it very well, is because obviously they, they fought that case. But um, we could probably forward the the summaries of the those cases that we got out. And uh, it, and the issue is whether or not the you know, how to interpret conclusions um, with regard to the one year deadline. Uh, it, it did. I mean, the case did imply that uh, a negative finding was appealable, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it to, is subject to the one year. Uh, one year deadline and that's that's what the, one of the came I mean it can anyway moving along uh the uh at the uh March 10th um uh, Ellen meeting uh they took three actions the first one was they created the office of the commission of practices and that was important for two reasons uh first uh you have to have an office in order to uh higher staff and so uh we had to create that and then secondly you have to have an office in order to get a budget and so in the budget cycle you have to have an an office uh where the money is allocated to and that re that requires an ordinance to a create a department uh, and so they uh, recommended that and so as an ordinance it goes before the full city council there's a second reading and then it becomes effective 30 days after the second reading unless somebody initiates a referendum on that which is <laughs> extremely unlikely um and sure have you heard when that's going to the council charmaine is muted and blank so she may have popped away for a second um anyway i, I the Last I heard, it was supposed to go before the city council uh, sometime in late this month, early next month, uh, and so it'll be sometime in May before it uh, becomes an official department. Um, but along with that, uh, they passed a resolution, or which will then be forwarded to the city council because the full city council makes the appointment of the uh, interim executive director. And uh, so the resolution, uh, as I understand it, will indicate that once the department uh, comes official, uh, then Charmaine will 
we'll move over. Um, the budget process, some good things have been happening there. Uh, we have progress in terms of uh, getting two supplemental positions for the current year, uh, one being an executive assistant and the other being uh, the complaints coordinator. Um, and so Charmaine uh, completed the paperwork uh, to get the positions posted. Um, and uh, the approvals are going through the Department of Finance right now, uh, but things are, are moving along there. Um, you know, it made close to the beginning of the next fiscal year before we actually get those positions filled, but at least uh, we will have, uh, you know, gotten them filled and not have to start from scratch at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, and then we uh, submitted our, um, our budget, uh, the one that we last uh, discussed. Uh, I think at the last bit explained that they had us redo our budget that uh, the budget was submitted uh, fit into their fiscal year uh, timelines. Um, and uh, they had some research in terms of classification of positions. Um, and then uh, this past week, uh, we recommended uh, three modifications to our proposed budget based upon uh, Jason's recommendations from uh, our uh, roundtable. Those uh, additions were to make uh, one of the... Uh, uh, investigators, a supervising investigator. And so we uh, changed the budget to reflect that. Uh, we uh, added um, a line item for professional services, which will include a translation services and uh, a transcription service, put uh, $15,000 for that. Um, and the uh, we also put in uh, an additional fifteen thousand dollars in the uh, training allowance, uh, five thousand dollars, but that was intended for the commission itself. Uh, so this would be for uh, the additional fifteen thousand was for the uh, for the staff. And then at a budget meeting uh, a couple of days ago, they indicated they wanted to move up the positions that we had recommended for the uh, fiscal year of the twenty twenty three. So not the not fiscal year, but the following fiscal year, they wanted to move them up sooner uh, so the positions can go ahead and be created and, and that would expedite the process uh, so it's that next year's budget uh, will be more than what we had proposed uh, and uh, if they're willing to do that we said go for it um, and so there well, since we are now a uh, or will soon be a uh, city department uh, we will have our own uh, budgeting uh, that'll happen sometime in uh, uh, the april or mid-april i guess it is and we'll be informed of uh, that we'll have to make a presentation and going to walk us through the uh, process of making a you know making a budget recommendation since this will be our first year you know going through that process um, but it feels good to actually have um <laughs> be going through the process and uh, they've been very receptive to the budget that we proposed you know they essentially took it and began punching it into their system um and so uh, as soon as we get information regarding uh, the dates of the hearings we'll let you know and it'll be helpful um and this is maybe directed specifically to uh, patrick and kate to get uh, public uh participation in those hearings because um, even if the proposal is to our liking we still need to make sure that we have uh, the money and if it's not to our liking it'll be even more important that we get uh, adequate funding uh, any questions regarding that i'll just say one of the um, really great outcomes of the roundtables so far is that community members are eager to show up to support the new commission and i think um even if we as you just said even if we have a budget even if they're considering a budget that we're happy with having community members show up to to sort of voice support of that will build a robust sense of the, the you know the city council's doing the right thing um so kate and i can work on that for sure i think community members are eager to show up to support us okay and uh, there's been no progress in the standing rules or really been focused on uh, other issues uh, and so we will uh, 
work on those as time permits, uh, but working on the investigation procedures and the budget and so forth are a higher priority right now. And I'm not sure there's been any changes to the website since our last meeting. Um, Charmaine, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Because uh, you were blocked out and, and muted, so that maybe you, <laughs> you you had to take a call or something. Uh, has there been okay. any changes to the website since the last meeting? No changes to the website. Well, no new changes. I've just been adding things and um, trying to update the, the member page, and um, but there hasn't been any new changes. Uh, so that brings us to our primary uh, agenda item uh, for today, which is a continued discussion of the investigation uh, process. Um, I, I guess I'd like to maybe focus our discussion in a couple of areas. I'll call on Patrick to give a summary of his recommendations. Um, and then uh, some of the issues I'd like to see us uh, talk about is... Uh, uh, how we will coordinate our investigations uh, with uh, with the police department investigations, uh, both in terms of uh, officer-involved shootings and custody deaths and other investigations. Uh, uh, second is uh, our method of uh, compelling attendance uh, by the department is, is uh, uh, compelling the department to provide the uh, um, documents that are needed to do our investigations. Um, and I think that there's good language from uh, San Francisco that we can use in, in our procedures for that. Um, a couple of critical ones are citing uh, how to, in, um, well, deciding how to decide which cases we're going to investigate. Um, as I think everybody knows, but just to clarify for Jason, uh, our commission has a hybrid uh, model, and so we will be required to investigate all officer-involved shootings and in-custody deaths, and we also be required to review all department investigations, since we will be reviewing all department investigations, and then we have the discretion to um, conduct uh, investigations if they fall into one of five different categories, and the categories are, are fairly broad. Um, but the question is, uh, do we make that decision and at what point do we make that decision makes the decision and so forth so i want to have a discussion of that and then finally uh the, have a discussion that we had a little bit about uh, previously but we didn't come to a conclusion on and that is the uh, concept of having um rings uh the commission uh conducting uh hearings of cases uh, much like clerk does clerk has a process for the three people three person um uh, in investigation uh, uh, hearings, uh, and then they have committee of the whole to hear, to conduct hearings on uh, in custody deaths and uh, officer involved shootings. And I kind of like uh, the procedures that the laid out. And so I'd like to have a discussion of whether we want to have the commission involved in conducting hearings. And if so, uh, what some of the procedures there might be. So having outlined some of the issues, and I'm, we, may not, we, may not, we may not get through all of these today, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll get some so we can begin putting pencil to paper of doing procedures. Um, and I do want to leave a little bit of time at the end of the meeting to uh, discuss the, uh, the other item of new business, which is indemnification and defense process for commissioners. Uh, that basically should not take much, uh, much time. Um, uh, I'm assuming it will basically be giving some direction to uh, the city attorney of uh, how to include that in the uh, in the implementation ordinance. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Patrick for his recommendations uh, from the uh, uh, forum that we had uh, with Jason uh, a week or so ago. Yep. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for that full um, setup uh, and. Uh, I just want to take a moment to express extreme gratitude to Jason Wechter, who's here today. Um, the commu I got so much praise 
about your presentation and your wisdom as a part of that discussion. And for you to take the time to talk to me in advance and plan the presentation and then be here today, um, I, you know, it, it can be thankless work. And I want you to know that in our case, it's not thankless. Um, we see you as a paragon of, um, of, of community engaged, rigorous oversight. Uh, and you, your name comes up more often than you would know among our discussions. Um, so for you to show up is sort of like, I don't know, um, Apollo descending from Olympus or something. <laughs> That's probably the wrong model, but there we are. Doug, I want to make one comment, a general comment about feedback, and then I think you've already hit three of the things, and it sounds like we have support for three of the recommendations. So I think I have 10 left, and I will write these up. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> the, the one of the larger things that we've been learning over time with the outreach organized and transition organized roundtables and then the policy committees last night is that our community is hungry for this level of engagement and this mode of engagement. And when it comes to questions like how to decide which cases to investigate, uh, which is one of the questions you just highlighted, I think we need to figure out what that's gonna look like in practice. Can a team nominate a case or say, we want this case to be investigated, does the board need to vote on it, et cetera. But a crucial thing we cannot forget is that the community has to be involved in that too. They can't be involved in a case-by-case decision-making because um, the cases are confidential, but they can be involved um, on the front side in helping us strategize. And then most importantly, <clears throat> I think on the other side, because we are striving to be transparent, to release information about cases at every stage and so on, we can ask the community to audit us on the cases over the course of a year. And the community can say, on these three cases, you didn't do an independent investigation and we think you should have, and these are the reasons why. So if we build in checkpoints like that, where we ask the community to audit us, essentially, um, and tell us or ask us to explain why didn't you investigate this one, what was your thinking, and so on, then I think we, we will continue to build more and more community support and backing. Um, and I think we'll be doing our job in terms of community engaged um, oversight. So that's just an overarching comment about making sure that we involve the community in every stage. Um, I'm going to move through these quickly. Um, Doug, you already hit three of them. The budget item, line item for interpretation uh, and translation, um, for transcription of audio, and the supervisory investigator, which were three very strong recommendations. So I won't talk about those. <clears throat> okay. One of the recommendations is that um, investigators uh, should have access to subject matter experts who can look at the officer training and policy and procedure and provide, again, subject matter input on um, uh, how officers are responding, how well the policy is written, and so on. And that should be a part of investigations, not separate from investigations. <clears throat> Pardon me. Subject matter experts can include mental health, um, people who work with uh, the unsheltered community, um, uh, protected group representatives, so LGBTQ representatives, and so on, depending on the, the context of the investigation. Um, okay, so that's one of the ones we talked about. Number two, and this is related to one of your um, highlighted points. We need to have an enforced protocol for obtaining documents in a timely manner. Um, and we should, uh, and this is part of what you brought up, we should have hard and fast language using shall um, that compels participation in an interview, even within the bounds of, um, you know, the sort of Fifth Amendment exclusions and so on. 
And at the meeting, not only SFPD, but Oakland PD, Berkeley PD, and BART PD were all named as agencies that may have helpful, um, may have helpful information here. All right, uh, next up, um, there should be an annual evaluation among the investigators and also among the staff and the wider commission um, that is an, an anonymous climate survey so that everybody involved with the CPP can weigh in every year, not only on how things are going, but what the climate of the group is, um, what tensions are present, what frustrations do people have, is there unconscious bias coming out, and so on. Uh, third, um, crime scene access and parallel investigations, parallel interviews need to be a priority and they need to be inscribed in the letter of the law. Um, that, you know, some aspects of that, I think we're probably going to hear require, meet, and confer. That came up at the roundtable. Um, but in any case, that needs to be understood, whether it's through an MOU, the ordinance, SOPs, whatever it is, it needs to be written, clear, again, using shall language, um, and the mechanisms uh, by which all of that happens need to be laid out clearly. Um, there was a, a, this is a kind of lower frequency suggestion, but it's crucial. Um, investigators should have immediate access to dispatch records um, through a computer terminal of some point so that we're not, investigators aren't just getting after the fact um, CAD reports, but are actually able to view the terminal. Um, next up, the investigating team, including the supervisory investigator, um, should have access to complaint histories. Um, obviously, there are strict limits because of POBAR laws on how those may be considered and so on. But at the very least, at the very, very least, CPP needs to have a rigorous system in place of tracking complaints and the complaint histories um, of individual people. Um, uh, another, this was a sort of cluster of suggestions that wasn't, it sort of came out of a discussion about the, how we think about the qualifications um, for investigators when we're doing the hiring. Um, and this was about the training of investigators. Uh, the community felt strongly that that training should be ongoing in the same way that we have continuing education. There should be structured, regular continuing education and training for the investigators. That should include unconscious bias training. It should include the wealth of information um, uh, on effective interviewing and ethical interviewing that Jason has provided us. Just a side note, I have degrees in anthropology and our method is interviewing. I have never received um, the kind of training that is uh, as specific, rigorous, ethical, and so on as Jason. So um, I think he's given us a lot to work with, but in any case, once we hire the investigators, we need to make sure they're continuing to receive training. Um, and then as a sub part of this, the community needs to be involved in that training. So the training should include interacting with community groups, asking community groups to come in and talk with the investigators, um, asking the investigators to teach the community how they do their job. Um, and then inviting comment and discussion about that. Uh, there was a strong, um, a strong feeling that that, um, that that should happen. Next, and this is something I don't think we've thought about before. Um, in terms of conducting background checks, um, and I think this was about everybody on the commission or, or you know, all of the staff and so on. Um, Jason, uh, made the recommendation that an independent agency be hired to do those background checks so that it isn't just, um, uh, Jason, maybe you can say more about this in a few minutes, but so that it isn't just the ones relied upon by uh, PD and the city, but that we actually have an independent agency um, step up to do those background checks. Um, and I, th I th that may have been not only about 
commission staff and commissioners, but also as a part of the investigations themselves. Um, and then you've talked about setting standards early, clearly, and in writing for access to SDPD records. Uh, I mentioned parallel interviews and so on. Um, and then there, the, the last thing I'll mention as a part of these recommendations, um, there, there was a discussion about uh, tracking officers when they're on duty and investigators having access whether it's to cell phone data, GPS data, and so on, facial recognition software. There was a discussion of, um, the, and this was near the end of the round table, so it wasn't a, a long discussion, but, but there was a discussion about finding a way for the investigators to have access to that kind of data so that in addition to body-worn camera footage and interviews and um, testimonies, um, the investigators should be able to actually figure out where everybody was at every minute in the same way that PD already can. Those are the main line things. There was a lot of other discussion, um, uh, but those are the things that were uh, taking shape as actual recommendations for us. So I can take questions or I can stop there. When he asked this question, does anybody disagree with any of uh, Patrick's recommendations? Or think that should be modified? I, I just, I, can, I, can I just add one thing that I highlighted? Um, uh, and, and that is that um, officers should not view body-worn cameras before they are interviewed. The, you can add that. Uh, that's a PD policy, and we recommended well, I, that uh, to the PD, I and, that, they, but that's and they rejected that we... the policy. Okay. Um, so that'll be sent to the policy committee again, because it needs that change, if it's ever going to happen, needs to happen at the level of policy and procedure revision. Okay. I agree, Kate. Uh, pushed hard and made our recommendations. Uh, we used, uh, you know, some experts of make and making our recommendations, uh, but the, the department, uh, for the reasons that Jason <laughs> said, uh, disagreed with that uh, strongly with D. Uh, and I know Nancy does too, and others of us who worked on that recommendation. Um, I, I'm not opposed to a pushing again, but just you know, to let you know that we agree. <laughs> we tried and were, and, and got a, fairly strong no from the PD on that, but that uh, doesn't mean I try again. Um, I've did got you know a second I, item, uh, yeah. Kate? And if not, uh, Joe, I think, wanted to speak. Okay, okay go ahead, I, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Patrick, since I'm taking notes, <coughs> and I was writing very fast, if, uh, could you email me yes. everything that you said? I'm going to write this all up, not only for us, but also for the community. I just haven't had a chance to do it yet. But Joe, if you want to just reference in your notes that I'll be sending the list of everything I talked about, that way you don't have to scramble. I'm sorry. I should have said that in advance, Joe. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> my my uh, two fingers now are just numb. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. Um, then uh, I want to be respectful, too, of uh, Jason's time since we have him here. And so I want to maybe follow up his thoughts on some of this. Um, and uh, Doug, I have a question for Patrick. Yes. Um, Patrick, we have access to what they call the AVL, the Automatic Vehicle Locator information for officers' patrol cars based on their GPS. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? I heard you say in real time, I thought. I didn't understand what, what the use of that would be. Well, that, the use of that would be for the investigators, not for commissioners. So the investigators, if they do have access to that dispatch terminal and they know that something is happening, um, they should also have access to the data. And I think car level data is good. I mean, we've all seen... How, what that looks like in, in, you know, in dispatch, for example. Um, but, you know, there are other kinds of tracking information that the police have access to that are more precise, that are more 
individualized, they were more personal. And the recommendation was that what the PD has access to in terms of tracking its own officers, um, when it comes to cases, then the investigators that are charged with, you know, doing investigations for an oversight body should also get access to that data. Um, and that, thank you for asking that, Nancy, because it reminds me that there was a sort of thread throughout this discussion that I didn't name as a specific um, recommendation, but I probably should have. The, the thread was that with these investigations, information should flow in one direction only. And this is a part of keeping the investigations parallel and separate. There shouldn't be investigators for the commission. I'm not sure what else to say, but but that the information. I, 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 I'm not sure what you mean. Can you give me an example by what you're, the point you're trying to make there? The, the idea is that we need to insist upon the independence of these investigations and they cannot um, they cannot be collaborative investigations in the sense that the investigators are working together and coming to the same conclusions and conversation with one another and so on. So the idea that a truly independent investigation, um, although there may be moments of um, interacting so as to make sure you're not stepping on each other's toes and so on, but that when the independent investigators get the information that we're asking for from PD, there's not then um, collaboration on yeah on coming to conclusions okay, yeah, that, that, and interpreting it. Yeah, and that then raises you know, one of the questions I wanted, wanted to ask Jason about, and that is uh, <clears throat> since uh, um, in the officer involved shootings in a custody desk, there will be uh, two. In Two indications: There'll be the commission investigation. There'll be the uh, homicide slash uh, internal affairs investigation. Um, and then on the discretionary cases uh, that uh, you know we allow to conduct a commission investigation on, there again there will be two uh, pair. Well, there'll be two investigations. There'll be an IA investigation and there'll be a commission investigation. And so. What suggestions uh, do you have? I, I like the idea of uh, to the degree possible of having a parallel um, interviews uh, and not just uh, listening to one another's interviews, but having uh, joint interviews where both uh, both entities can ask questions. Because it seems to me that especially if you have a complainant um, and maybe other witnesses as well, they don't want to be once by internal affairs and then entered by the by the commission i think that the members of the public would prefer to be interviewed one time one time jointly is that workable um and what models have you seen of how uh, parallel interviews so maybe maybe that's more, more of what i'm what i'm thinking of is parallel interviews as opposed to parallel investigations. Does that make sense? So let, let me ask Jason to give his feedback on that if I could. Yes, well, that's what they do in Oakland at the Community Police Review Agency where they do joint interviews. And um, you probably wanna talk more to the director there, John Alden, who's a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, I, I know they have a very good working relationship with internal affairs. No, I don't know if that's a function of just the attitude of the department or the attitude, the quality of the commander in internal affairs. But I think most of the officer interviews are done jointly, uh, collaboratively. Um, and uh, I believe the complaint interviews are done uh, depending on whether the person brings the complaint to internal affairs or whether they bring it to CPRA. That, that indicates who's gonna uh, do the interview, I believe. Um, okay, but but John could clarify that more because I I I've, I've been there as I mentioned working on one specialized case, so I haven't dealt with complaint. Uh, I've really been doing more with command staff officers. Um, well, um, could you provide us a uh, contact information? Yes, yes, and uh, I, I assume it's okay. Use your name when we contact oh, yes. him. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm and, be, uh, this afternoon I'll I'll mention it. 
uh, John. John. John is also very active in NACL. So okay. Um, and is there somebody a, who? Can I raise a question about that? Um, maybe to Jason. Yes. About sure. the, the joint interview thing. Um, one of the concerns, you know, in talking to a, a lot of people in the community, is this is the Im intimidation, the the unconscious probably intimidation in an interview when a police officer is doing the interview. And so I'm wondering how that works if you're talking about having both the independent commission investigator and an IA person. Is that what you're saying? Doing the interview together with the complainant and with other no. witnesses? No, no, just with the police officers. O oh, only just with, the police uh, officer only, only interview. interview. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I, I, I believe that the uh, civilian investigators interview civilian witnesses um, independently. But that's also something to ask John about because again, my, my experience there has been more limited. Um, but he's also a good resource because he previously headed uh, a unit in the San Francisco District Attorney's Office that investigated all officer involved shootings. So he can talk with you about how those parallel investigations, the criminal investigation worked, uh, meshed with the administrative investigation. Okay, well, that, that's a good question, Kate, because I was thinking of the possibility of doing uh, joint uh, interviews of, <coughs> of complainants witnesses. Um, and <coughs> You no, know, a benefit of that is they don't have to be interviewed twice, uh, but they may prefer to be interviewed without a police officer present. And so that's um, that's a good point. Uh, I, believe, I believe the way it works in Oakland, there's a job classification called intake technician. We have them in our office, and I believe they also work in internal affairs, and those are civilian positions. And they do the initial intake interview with the complainant. So the complainant is dealing with a with a civilian and uh, then there may be follow-up interviews if the investigator has, has additional questions. But that's something you should ask John about because I, I don't want to speak for the agency because I just don't have that much uh, uh, expertise in, in the, those processes. Okay. Is there a volunteer who would uh, be willing to uh, make that uh, call and report back to uh, this committee? I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to contact John Alden, and the point is to to get some specifics about joint interviews um, of police officers, independent interviews of civilians, and then how um, well intake interviews, and then also interacting with the criminal investigation. How those interviews work? Is that right? Those are the four. Right. And I, and I guess find out whether or not there is any joint interviews uh, with civilians, civilians being either witness and or uh, complaints. Okay, got uh, it. And, right. yeah. and the pros and cons of doing that. Uh, and, and I think that's really, really important because I think Kate brings up a good point, Patrick, when you talk to him, because that couldn't be very, very intimidating if, it's, if it was done by, by the police. It would be to me. And... Um, Okay, and actually, that I think is care of uh, one of the items I had on my list for today, which is coordination of investigations. Uh, I think we've already talked about the compelled attendance uh, of simply including something similar to uh, San Francisco, and you mentioned uh, in your foundation, Patrick, which came from Jason, some other agencies, I think it was BART. Uh, BART, Oakland, and Berkeley. Those were the ones named. I mean, no surprise, they're all in the Bay Area. I'm sure there are others elsewhere, but we should start there. And uh, you know, and then a key question, and the next job we're going to require more discussion, but uh, and that is a whether we want to have commissioners conduct hearings, uh, and there seemed to be support for that last time we discussed it. Um, um, but the other key item, and I think maybe we'll discuss it first, is that deciding how to it, how to determine which uh, cases we're going to investigate in, and at what point in time do we do that, and what is the process for making that uh, that decision? Um, and uh, oh, it, 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 and part of that is determine when when are we going to make that decision. And it may not be. 
you know, there, there may be several different options. Uh, so there could be some cases that uh, as they come in, it's clear uh, that uh, they meet the uh, guidelines and uh, we can ask the commission for authority to do an investigation front. And we don't, um, on the other hand, there may be a situation where uh, the commission does its uh, review of uh, internal affairs investigations and uh, finds that there are inadequacies or questions and determines uh, after reviewing uh, the IA investigation, they wanted their own independent investigation. Um, so there could be two decision points. There could be one up front as after the uh, complaint is made uh, that a case should be referred to the commission to uh, <coughs> conduct an investigation. I I'm guessing, and maybe and people can correct me if they have a different thought, my guess is that probably where a majority vote of the commission itself to conduct an investigation. Um, and so that, that's my initial thought is that we would have two decision points. So one up and that could be a recommendation from a staff member. It could be a senior in investigator or somebody who's assigned that role. It could be a complaint coordinator, but we could have recommendations from staff as complaints come in that uh, this is a case that uh, cries out for an independent investigation to uh, make a decision when the invest when the uh, complaint is made uh, that we would do that uh, a good example that comes to my mind is the case that came up last week uh, with the uh, uh, gun that was allegedly pointed at the uh, at the juvenile during the traffic stop uh, to me that, that seemed clear that there's great public interest in that that was on TV, there were protests and so forth, and uh, that that would be something that we ought to decide up front uh, that we're going to investigate. And, and there could be other cases that we decide after we uh, review the internal affairs investigation that we're not satisfied and we think that there ought to be an investigation and we ought to be able to do it at either, either decision point. So I'll stop there and see what others think in terms of what the process of deciding um, you know, whether cases uh, should be investigated. I think everybody um, is pretty much aware of what those five uh, criteria are. There are cases where the result, well, use of force cases that result in uh, serious bodily injury, um, dishonesty by a police officer, um, uh, incidents in which the data, uh, well, incidents in which there is a uh, significant public interest, and then uh, incidents in which uh, there's data to show uh, a pattern either by the officer or a pattern by the department itself. So those are the, those are the criteria. Um, so thoughts on on my thought of having a two decision points at which the commission could make that determination. I, I have a couple of thoughts. The first one is that last one that you just named, um, patterns, uh, it, it, it emphasizes the um, one of the recommendations from the community that, that the CPP maintain a rigorous history of complaints tied to individuals and tied to other patterns. Um, I think we want to leave, I think as the interim commission, we want to leave as much flexibility in the process as possible. Um, so for the time being, in terms of a standard operating procedure, I agree that by majority vote, given a quorum, um, the board can refer any case that falls into one of those five categories for investigation. I like the idea of involving investigators and other staff, including the intake staff and the community engagement staff in the process so that the staff can make a recommendation um, to the commission. And then just to say this again, I think if we explicitly and proactively invite and urge the community to audit us, however we decide to do it from the outset so that a year from now, they can audit our cases and let us know how we can tweak these practices. I just think that needs to be, looking forward, that needs to be built in 
um, to this process. But overall, I agree with the idea of a majority vote being what would enable an investigation. And do you agree with uh, the ability to uh, do that, that at least two decision points, one at the very beginning prior to the IA investigation and conclusion of the IA investigation? And it doesn't, that would not include another decision point. So say, say for example, we continue to use our team approach to reviewing IA investigations, which we may or may not do. Uh, but if we do, say we continue to have uh, teams look at uh, investigations and in the middle of doing their investigation, they, well, I guess that was the after IA invest after IA investigation is done because the team would not review it until after then. And so. Well, I would uh, say at any point, I mean, from the moment the complaint is taken until the moment the, the case has been closed, I would just say at any point, the board can determine that a case needs to be sent out for investigation. I don't think I would isolate it at two points even. I think I would say from the moment the complaint's taken until the moment the case is voted on and closed. Okay. But in terms of process, I think that it does make sense to say that uh, one process is to have staff flag it. Uh, second is a recommendation from whoever does the evaluation and leave it uh, full enough so that there'd be other points in between. Okay. Uh, other thoughts on that issue? I have a question. Um, the case where the public thought the gun was pointed at the juvenile, we didn't even have a complaint. And yet there was a show of public interest that in my mind at least would could trigger an investigation, um, but we don't have a complaint yet. How are we gonna handle cases where there is obvious uh, community interest at, in some issue or some incident, we don't have a complaint. Are we going to be able to, to like jumpstart that kind of thing? Well, we, we accept the third party complaints. And uh, so I, I think if there is a significant public interest that there would be a community member who would, uh, would make a complaint that there could be other ways of uh, doing that. So thoughts, Nancy's uh, Yeah, I, I have questions. a thought. Uh, I, I, I thought that the Charter Amendment allowed the Commission on its own to, um, if something like that comes up without a complaint. No, it doesn't. It, 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 it only gives a bill. It, it specifically says uh, complaints. Um, and yeah. so it. Yeah, well, so a Commission it, it, member it, it, could make a complaint. Is that correct? That's and a good question. Could they? Can a Commissioner make a complaint? I, I would argue. I would argue yes. I mean, we're all citizens mm -hmm. of the city of San Diego. If we saw something that was on the news that we found was troublesome, and we chose to to officially file a complaint, if there wasn't one, I mean, there's nothing that would prohibit us from doing that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Why why wouldn't we? if uh, if we thought that it was a, it was a concern, and certainly a public opinion, that uh, I think that we would be uh, not doing our job if we didn't. Okay, so okay, I, then I, probably I ought to be. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, go I'm, ahead. Thinking, I, I'm thinking we may want to make sure we include that in the procedures, then, so it's clear that uh, in any commissioner uh, has the ability to file a complaint. That's a good, a good question, Kate. Um, is there any? Uh, um, I don't want to assume that simply because two people agree that everybody agrees. Does any disagree with that? Okay, uh, then, then I think I'd answer that question. That, uh, Doug, I would just recommend that if we're explicitly including that, then we, I mean, this should be obvious, and I'm sure it's included more generally under the conflict of interest section, but we should, if we're going to say any commissioner can file, or staff member for that matter, can file a complaint, then whoever files the complaint would immediately be recused from all consideration of that complaint. I think it's worth saying that explicitly. Maybe it's your staff. I, I'm not sure I agree with the staff. I think maybe staff can flag it and then you know, bring it to the attention of the chair or something, but I, I'm not sure that we want the staff to initiate or to file a complaint. Why not? 
Right. If a staff member has a bad interaction with a police officer, I, I would hope that they could file a complaint about it. Oh, I mean, on, I'm talking about third party complaints. But um, I, yeah, I think if a staff member sees something outside the work, work and files a third party complaint, they could file a complaint. I, I don't think we should exclude staff from this. Okay. Other let's thoughts on that? To, let's still go to the commission. And um, okay, so is everybody comfortable with allowing the commissioners and staff to have the ability to make yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and and they are the complainant, then they should recuse themselves uh, from the complaint. Is that? You, you know, I, I don't see see why not. Why why couldn't a staff a staff member? Uh, that I, I don't think that that should be uh, excluded. Okay. So there, there, there's also one thing that I want to circle back with uh, with uh, Patrick. Uh, and I hope Patrick is still here. I, I don't see your face, Patrick. I'm so sorry. I'm back. My doorbell keeps ringing. And so I have to, I'm, <laughs> that's why I keep disappearing, but I'm here. Uh, I, I just had that a, a moment ago myself. Uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, on the issue of uh, an audit, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to that, but I, I, I would like to get a little bit more information of just exactly how that would work. Uh, you know, that, that could really, really stall us out. Uh, so I, I'm sure there's a, there's a procedure that we can implement to, uh, to, to have that transparency with, with the community, which I think is important. But uh, I, I would like a little bit more information on that. Sure. I, at, 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 at some time, Patrick. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll work with the community on that. I'll put that to them. Um, but the idea is that they, we wouldn't, so we already are going to release all this information and then the community will be watching it and have access to it. I just think we should be more proactive about saying we want your feedback on how we're doing. And this might be one of the ways that we do that. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, I, I, I totally agree, agree with that. And that's, that's a transparency that we, 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 which we absolutely essential, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the details of it would have to get worked out for sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, and to answer the question you had of a white not staff, it may be, you know, a person who makes the complaint accuse themselves that may not be um, expeditious for the staff to make the complaint. Uh, they may want to bring it to the attention of uh, a commissioner to make the complaint on their behalf that the investigator wouldn't have to recuse themselves. Yeah, I, you know, I think that, that all can be worked out, Doug. Uh, right. Just, okay. Just, but, a, just uh, a quick question on, you know, on commissioners and staff filing complaints. So how does that look as an independent body? I just, you know, explain that. How would that look as an independent body if we are um, interjecting ourselves into that whole process? That's just my question. You know, I guess I, I guess my thought is that if there's something that is uh, awry and we become, uh, I think we have a duty as an independent commission to to suggest it for investigation. Um, what we are suggesting, we are suggesting. Excuse me. We are, we are suggesting it for an investigation. However, we're doing the investigation. So how is that? Well, I think, I think Diane, I understand what you're asking. Um, I think, Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think, I don't actually think this is going to happen all that much. I think. Even if it's know, not going to happen all that much, the idea that's suggesting that it might be something that we would do gives a very, um, dubious as to because we have we we have information that sometimes the public does not have. And I, I see what you're once saying. We, once we start interjecting ourselves into that whole process, then it becomes less independent. So I, I think what I hear you saying is, on one hand, we are asking for all of this sort of internal information from the police. Absolutely. including a history of complaints. Absolutely. If we then come out and say, oh, and by the way, all of us who have all this access can also file these complaints, then that's going to create friction with our ask for that information. 
Just, a, I mean, it was just a question. I mean, if yeah. we're going to be independent, then independent should be independent. So we're not. Um, I'm just a question. That's just my. So thought. I think maybe maybe Doug, this is a point to say. I mean, in the current system, anybody can file a complaint. There's no. There's nothing that says a commissioner cannot file a complaint. There's nothing that says a staff member cannot file a complaint. So maybe we don't need to include this language. Maybe we don't. I think we probably do. So if it comes up, it's clear. Um, but I would also, agree, well, two things. I don't think it would happen very often because I think if, especially if it's some, something that's going to meet those criteria, uh, there are going to be people in the community who file complaints. You know? So for example, the, you know, of the incident happened last week. Uh, well, I think in that incident, the, the, uh, the father said he was going to file a complaint, uh, but if, even if he didn't, I'm sure that uh, there are other people who maybe have already filed complaints. But I think that, that since we accept third-party complaints, that uh, it may not be necessary all that often for a staff or a commissioner to do that. Then to circle back to a point or something you said, Patrick, we're not requesting uh, the department to, we're not compelling the department to give us information on all incidents. We're compelling them to give us information on incidents in which the complaint has been raised. Uh, so we're not, you know, well, like we're taking uh, all of this information and we're going through and just, we're going to make a complaint on this and a complaint on that. We're compelling them to give information if we received a, uh, you know, received a complaint. Yeah, but we are, I think to Diana's point, we are asking, um, well, I have two things to say. First of all, we are asking for access to things we don't, as a rule, that we don't currently have, at least not explicit access to. And in, in what we were talking about earlier, there were several items on these recommendations um, that were general access to information, not case specific. So I understand where Diane is coming from. I do think what we hear from NACOL over and over and over again is that if you're doing your job with community engagement, transparency, and accountability to the community, then the community will trust you and, and therefore will file the complaints that it, that it wants to file. And if there's an issue that is of community concern and you have that good relationship with the communities that you represent, this question isn't even going to come up because they'll file it. They'll, they'll trust you. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't think there are any exclusions on who can file a complaint. And I'm, I'm now wondering if we need to include the explicit provision that commissioners can file complaints. I, I just, I wonder if we need that. I think it's wise to, if we're going to contemplate the possibility to include it so that if it does happen, it's clarified prior to it, the situation. So can I ask, before we work up this language, and spend a lot of time thinking about it. Can we look can we at Jason, other agencies? Your, can we ask Jason what his thinking is on, yes. on, on this? I think you should ask other agencies if they have a, an explicit policy about this. In San Francisco, we didn't have anything specifically addressing this other than um, potential conflicts with the agency. So I once observed something happening on New Year's Eve and an officer ordered me to leave, which is an illegal order. So I filed a complaint over that as a member of the oversight agency. Obviously I was firewalled from that complaint. They interviewed me as they would any other member of the public. And I got no other notification other than a member of the public would have. So, um, you know, that was uh, not an issue, but uh, what you want to avoid is someone coming across information through their work and then saying, I want to file a complaint about it. that's information that would not be available to a member of the public. In other words, more confidential information that you come across in, in the course of an investigation, which we always emphasize was absolutely confidential and could not be shared outside the agency. Yeah, so maybe we ought to uh, clarify, make two clarifications. Number one is that uh, if a staff member or commissioner file a complaint that can't base it on confidential information and they were required to, to recuse themselves from that. So, okay, well, we, we, 
maybe you spend more time on that than we needed to, but I think it's a, a, a good question. Um, and uh, it's, Shane had this to uh, drop off because she had another meeting to go to at one. Um, and but why don't we go ahead and try to complete our agenda. The only other item that we had today was the hearing process. And we discussed the previous meeting, and I'm not sure whether people had a chance to look at the CLURB's uh, hearing, uh, hearing procedures, but CLURB has a process where they uh, can refer to um, board members uh, to conduct a hearing. And it can be a broad hearing or, or it can be focused on a particular issue. And uh, they have specific uh, uh, you know, procedures for conducting those hearings. Uh, you know, they can interview complainants, they, they can interview uh, subject officers in those hearings. Um, and they can recommend finding the find of that uh, hearing and then go to the full commission. Doug, and, can uh, I ask a quick question? Uh -huh. I'm wondering if um, if we could have a, a whole meeting about that question. I think it's crucial. And I think um, Andrea St. Julian has thought a lot about this. And if, if we wanted to invite her to this meeting to share some of her thinking, um, and maybe Brandon, I don't know, um, maybe Kylie as well as part of the National Lawyers Guild. Um, but I agree that that's a big thing we need to figure out to get into the ordinance. And maybe we should have a whole meeting and invite um, some people who've thought about it in the San Diego context to talk with us too. Well, and maybe have somebody from CLURB. Um, yeah, great. Who, uh, I don't want to get too many people, but I think uh, Andrea and uh, somebody from CLURB might be uh, good to do that with. Um, And I think maybe I, you know, hearing things say that maybe we ought to, rather than try to discuss it further today, uh, set up that for our next meeting. And uh, how does that sound for people? Because uh, it, is, it is a key issue. And I'm not sure whether I had the chance to read the uh, CLURB's uh, procedures. Uh, that was one of your homework assignments from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you didn't, I'm going to give you demerits. Uh, but seriously, I think that you ought to you ought to look at that because they have some real well thought out uh, procedures for doing that, and um, and different types of hearings, um, and how they compel attendance at the hearings themselves as opposed to interviews from investigations and so forth. And so, Doug, I think uh, Kate Kate was trying to speak. Oh, I'm sorry, Kate. Kate, were you? Well, no, I was just trying to get a little clarification on what the issue was. I, I think I'm kind of getting it now. Yeah, the and, issue is whether or not just, we're, and I, we're gonna And if uh, Doug is gonna, I think it would be better if Doug would contact Andrea than me because he's probably clear on the issue. Okay, yeah, and so the issue is, uh, will the commission conducting uh, investigatory hearings uh, and uh, what are the procedures for for doing that? Um, involving commissioners themselves in conducting hearings, uh, which is would be a new function for us. Uh, there's going to be support for doing that. Last time we discussed that, and so um, hearing no objection, uh, then uh, we will. Uh, set up uh and i'll try to do it for noon next week if uh if we can find somebody from club and somebody and if andrea is is it andrea or andrea andrea i keep forgetting andrea because Andre, uh, i know people with both pronunciations and i get them confused um next week assuming that they're available next week at noon uh then does that work for people Okay, and then before we go on to the final item, is since we have Jason here, and Jason, thank you very much for coming. You've been so generous with our with your time, with us and we really do appreciate it. Here, is there any other regarding uh, 
the issue of investigations or things in his area of expertise that people want to uh, ask him about before before we conclude today? Or anything, Jason, that you want to add to our discussion that, that I think is important for us to think about? A couple of things about access to materials. Um, the CAD terminal that OCC had may have been very specific to them um, and to the technology she set up. So I would see what access internal affairs has to that and to other documents. Um, and, uh, you know, at Oakland CPR, we don't have a terminal like that, but we get those materials very quickly through internal affairs. So um, uh, I, I would just look at what, what their access is and aim to try, ask for what the access they have. And, you know, that may be limited somewhat by the technology, um, given that they're probably in the police building. I'm assuming that this agency will not be in the police building. Will be another location. Yes, we're going to have our own, uh, our own. Uh... Yeah, and that would also apply to uh, body worn camera footage. If you can get immediate access to that, that's preferable. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention in terms of resources, and you may already have this: uh, cars, because the investigators will need to do field work, and I don't know if they would be using city pool vehicles, but particularly because you're going to be investigating officer-involved shootings. Uh, they often occur at night or on weekends, so someone's probably going to be need to go off work hours to those, and so they may need to have a, a city vehicle to take home in order to to do that, because you can't you know, expect someone to have their own vehicle that they'll be able to use. So if that's not in the budget, you certainly want to want to have that there. Okay, uh, that's a good a good question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, well, Charmaine's still here. Um, I don't know if you heard that, Charmaine. I don't. I think she's just still here, so we can keep meeting. We, we I can think keep meeting. Okay. Gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that good, uh, very good thing we didn't think about is it is not on our budget, um, and so uh, I'm glad you brought that up, and we can ask that question. The finance will be happy with us keep coming back for more, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's better to think of it now than to think of it after the budget process. Don't for, stop uh, till they say enough, right, Doug? <laughs> and um, and we didn't really put money in for subject matter experts. Maybe we ought to include that as in a consultant's line item. So I need. We need to maybe take a look at that as well. Uh, but, I, but a key thing is asking the question about the uh, vehicle access, whether it's a city pool, and if not, uh, how other departments uh, ha handle it, whether they have a reimbursement of per vehicles or uh, uh, whether the departments get charged uh, for if there's a city pool. To, we, does each department get charged back and so forth? And so that's a good, a good question. And sufficient. Doug, I, I, I'm going to have to leave in about five minutes. So. Yeah. Okay. No, no problem, Joe. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up soon. Uh, but I wanted to give Jason a a, uh, a chance to weigh in, and then we have one more brief agenda item. Yeah, and sufficient technology because you're going to be dealing with data files that may be larger than other agencies have because you're going to have audio files and video files, which take up, take up a lot of disk space. Um, so, you know, we, we put in a large uh, request for technology, so that probably okay. ought to cover that. So. Okay, great. You're covered. Okay. Um, then let's move on to our last item. We, there was a question that we asked. Uh, where's my papers here? Um, our council uh, that came up, I think it was in a uh, cabinet meeting. Uh, but the questions were, uh, does the city pay indemnification to the commission and individual commissioners and commission staff? And the short answer to that was yes, uh, that there are uh, laws in the city charter uh, provides that indemnification. So, uh, but the second one was that if the commission, individual commissioners or commission staff are sued during the scope of their commission work, who provides their defense? Uh, is it the commission's legal counsel, uh, the city attorney's office, or outside counsel hired by the city? And the response we got back was unclear. Uh, they thought it was a good question. 
Uh, they said it was likely that either the commission's legal counsel or outside counsel hired the city uh, rather than the city attorney's office would would provide our defense uh, since we're supposed to be independent from the city attorney's office. Um, but they thought that should be something that should be clarified by the city council. Um, and so my thought is that we should ask the city attorney to come up with a recommendation to include in the uh, implementation ordinance. Maybe we can give them even more specific guidance, but I think it does make sense that uh, it should not be the city attorney. It should either be our own council or outside council. Um, Unfortunately, we've got Kate on this committee. So if anything happens to us, Kate, you've got our back, right? Pro bono, <laughs> pro bono. Only if you want a divorce. <laughs> uh, that's I've I've already been there. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you know, that, you know, you know, Doug, that that's a very good question. I didn't even think about that, but I think that's a huge question because just like error, errors and omissions, insurance and so on, is that uh, we should we could very we could be very very vulnerable to uh, to, to uh, the lawsuits. So who who would cover that? We, covers that. Well, and part of it is to the cost. Um, yeah, exactly. And so, and so if we do get sued um, and, uh, you know, and, and say we have a staff, which is what we're putting in our budget is having our own staff attorney. Um, you know, the staff attorney may not have the uh, time and expertise to do it along with all their other duties and may require outside counsel and uh, we guarantee that the city will fund that outside council. Um, so, well, you, 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 you never know if our, if our attorney is a, is a uh, uh, attorney that can, can take, take, take cases to court. So, right. And the attorney himself could be the person who's being sued. <laughs> they could sue uh, the staff. They could that would, might include the uh, the attorney themselves. Um, so, is there any objection to me ask suggesting to Joan that she address that issue in the uh, implementation ordinance of uh, how? Uh, uh, well, the, the issue of indemnification is covered defense is not is not covered and uh, Christina's recommendation is that uh, it should be clear city council which in my opinion means it should be in the or in the implementation ordinance itself uh, so unless there's an action I will suggest to uh, Joan ask Joan to include a clarification of that issue in the implementation ordinance and, su and suggest not only ask for clarification but suggest her that we believe that it should be uh, our own council or outside council and the funding for that should uh, come from the city outside of our normal budget. Doug, I, I think we agree that it should be outside council. I don't think right. we I don't think we want it to be our council. No, I agree. Okay. I'm going to need to drop off. Uh, Okay. Well, thank you again, and we're, we're going to here momentarily. Uh, but thank you, again. Patrick. Thank, you. thank you so much. You're very welcome. Bye bye. Yeah. And Doug, I got to drop off. Okay. And so I we're, you know, we're going to meet uh, next week at noon if people if uh, we can get that set up with Blurb and um, um, Andrea Saint Julian and uh, Patrick. Uh, hopefully, before next week, you'll have an opportunity to connect. Uh, with, uh, I forget his name. John Alden. John Alden. Um, and uh, Pat also will get his recommendations uh, to all of us so that Joe can include those in the minutes. And as there is... Um... Uh, can, I, can I just make one more one comment before people drop off? Because I have sure. to leave two. And I just want to thank Brandon and Charmaine for, um, for doing that uh, round table last night that we had on the San Diego uh, police policy. It was excellent. And I was really, um, I, I guess Charmaine's gone, but for her to, to work from six to eight on this round table, I see what you're talking about, about her doing the work of two people. It's just incredible. And, and I want to thank uh, Brandon, you know, I've already said this before about this very insightful 
comments on the police policy. And there's, as you can see from last night, there's very strong interest in this. And I'm hoping that I can get a lot of comment Tuesday night. I don't, I don't know. Um, but there's a whole lot of problems <laughs> with that. And I think they were raised last night. And I'm, I'm sure that, you know, Brandon will have notes and will uh, tell the full commission about it. But I just wanted to shout out to both Brandon and Charmaine for last night's round table. Yeah, yeah. You know, Brandon, you, get, you really did a good job, but don't let it go to your head. <laughs> it's too too late. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Any other items or concerns? Okay, uh, then uh, last text and uh, we're adjourned. <laughs> have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Do you have time for uh, me to call you real quick? You know, I, I've I've got to run. So uh, yeah, okay. I, my 